Uh, sorry. <laughs> All right. So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to the seminar. Uh, today we have uh, our speaker today, Dr. Thomas J. Overby. Uh, professor Overby is a professor and holder of O'Donnell Foundation Chair Three in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Texas A&M University. Prior to joining TAMU, he was a professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Before starting his academic career, he was employed with Medicine Gas and Electric Company. He is the original developer of Power World Simulator, a co-founder of Power World Corporation, and author of a widely used power system analysis and design book, and is a member of US National Academy of Engineering. Professor Overby will, will be talking to us about an approach for the direct inclusion of weather information in electrical grid analysis. So okay. Back to you. Thank you. I guess we covered the first slide here. Um, <laughs> so I'm I'm going to talk about putting weather in the power flow, and this is based on the work of a lot of different people and papers and, and things like that. And it has been implemented in Power World Simulator version 23. And I'll give you, if you're interested in the papers, I'll give you a link at the end. Um, so what's the purpose? The purpose here is to say there can be lots of benefits from putting weather information directly in the power flow. And I assume most people here know about the power flow. Uh, I've got a little bit of background, but not too much here. Um, weather impacts the electric grid, of course, and it's impacted the ele electric grid from the beginning. But with the rise of wind and solar, and there's so much of it now, it is impacting the grid much more. So we thought, why don't we directly include weather? So kind of a motivation for this is in 2020, we were doing a study for Southwest Power Pool looking at joining the eastern and western grids. And in doing that, we had a model of the east and we had a model of the west. And most of what we were doing was stability simulations. So in stability simulations, you just take the initial dispatch of the generators and don't change it around. But some of what they wanted us to do was economic analysis. And in economic analysis, I, I have to change the output of, of the generation. And if you look at the generation in the U.S., and our, our models covered Canada and, and a little bit of Mexico, but I don't, I don't have generation type data for Canada because it's not public. But in the U.S., all the generator data is public. So you know the, the type of generator. And that's a visualization of the EIA 860 data. This is, this is public data that you can download. And... The green is the wind and the yellow is the solar and the um, size of the ovals is proportional to the amount of generation at the bus. And when I solve an OPF, you know, the wind and solar have like zero cost. So I'm going to dispatch them at the maximum. But what is their maximum? Their maximum for wind depends on the wet on, on the or for, for the wind turbines depends on the wind speed. And for solar, it depends on time of day and the cloud cover. So we're like, how are we gonna do this? And the solution was, why don't we just bring in weather data? And so that's what we started to do. Um, when I when I give this talk, people will say, well, wait a minute, you're talking about putting weather data in, in power systems. Uh, we've been using weather data for a long time. And it's like, yeah, we've, we've been using weather data and the use of weather information goes back to the 1880s. Uh, Real-time control has long used weather information. I used to work, as, as you mentioned, Mass and Gas Electric, and I worked in their control room in the 80s. And I was working there as a student and my senior project when I was an undergrad in 1983, was to bring weather data into the mg &E control center from a teletype. There was a, a teletype and it was telling us every hour the temperatures. And I had data bringing it through an Apple E computer that brought it into our control center so the operators would have it. So I, I know about that. Um, in the 80s, I used to like to go out biking and I we had weather radar then. So I'd go and check the weather radar in the control room to see if I was gonna get rained on. So I know weather has been used a long time and it plays a lot of roles in planning. Of course, load forecasting one of is one of them. 
but it's not directly used when you solve a power flow. And the purpose of this was to say, let's make it so it's simple when you solve a power flow. So this is all about, can we do this simply? Um, the power flow, it's also called the load flow and that, that those two terms have been used for a long time, tells how power flows through the transmission system. And you were just talking about the distribution system in class today, right? So it's also used in the distribution system. Um, when, when we started developing digital computer approaches in, in the 1950s, they had algorithms starting to come up to do this, but the computers at the time were very memory limited. So in developing models and stuff, they had to be very cognizant of what they put in the power flow. Um, and that has persisted to some extent to the present. Typically what we're doing on a power flow is you have fixed generation and, and load and, and you solve it and you get the voltages and that gives you the flows. When you add optimization to this, then you're trying to say, how, how do the outputs of the generators changes? And that's where this most comes in. Um, in talking about power flow, the word can be used in different ways. I like to think of power flow as a system. Um, in, in its most specific sense, power flow is just thought of the core algorithm. Like we might teach the newton raphson power flow in an undergrad class, but more broadly, it includes the core algorithms, but it also includes external algorithms that are used to do stuff like how do you handle automatic generation control, tap control, things like that. And then as you get broader, you can think of the power flow as not just being the algorithms, but also the set of models that goes into it. And then as you get broader beyond that, you can think about it as also including the input data that goes into it. And then it also includes the human machine interface, including the visualizations. So this talk mostly focuses on this part here. I'm not talking about modifying the core algorithm, but I am talking about bringing additional models and data in. Um, I, one of my favorite quotes is from George Box. I, I got all my degrees from Madison. George Box, formed the statistics department at Madison in 1960. Um, and he is quoted as saying, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I, I use this quote all the time because I, I think it kind of summarizes engineering in that our models are going to be approximation to reality. There's always some degree of approximation. We're never going to be perfect. Um, and then the practical question, which Box goes on to say in, in this book, is how long do they have to be to not be useful? And, you know, the challenge in engineering is what is the appropriate level of modeling? And this talk is going to say, look, I think the appropriate level of modeling in the power flow can include weather, and we can come up with some pretty easy to use models and data. Um, when, when I say this, I, I do have to add the caveat that says, look, you should still implement your models correctly. Just because they're wrong doesn't mean you should deliberately screw them off. Um, and when when we do like code changes in power world, sometimes if we're model, modifying the core algorithms, like getting into the Jacobian, I always like to make sure you got quadratic convergence to make sure I implemented it correctly. So we, we do care about that, but they're ultimately going to be wrong at some point. Um, okay, when you model stuff in engineering, you're always dealing with the trade-off. Okay, and in in power flow, when we typically teach power flow at the transmission level, we're taking a un, or a three-phase system that is actually unbalanced. The thing we're going to represent it as a equivalent balanced system, and that's good enough. Okay, so that's that's one assumption we make. Um, you might say which models to use to do that. You need to know, does the model exist? Do we understand the physics? Uh, if it exists, do we know the parameters? If we don't know the parameters, maybe we don't want to model it. How much memory is required to store it? How much computation is required to utilize the model? Uh, impact of the model and the ultimate results and the compatibility with existing software. To give you an example in the power flows, in the power flow, we treat the line resistance as constant. Okay. 
the line resistance is not constant, you know, because we know the lines are made of copper and aluminum, and copper and aluminum, their resistance changes by, I think it's 0.4% per degree C. So that, that's a big deal if you're trying to optimize losses that are changes. We know it changes, but we just say, ah, well, that would be too complicated. It really doesn't affect too much. So we just treat it as, as fixed. Um, a little bit of power flow history. When the power flow was introduced in the 50s, they did amazing things with very little memory. The initial power flows, uh, like when Tinney published his paper in the mid 1960s, he was using 32 kilobytes of memory and he solved the 700 bus power flow. And when you start looking at how much memory that was per bus, it, it's pretty low. When I started writing Power World in, in the 1980s, the late 1980s, I had a computer that had 120 kilobytes or 256 kilobytes of memory. So it's like memory was a big deal. And my power flows were on, um, I had a, a 320 or 360K kilobyte floppy. So it's like, I could not make too big a power flow. It's like now when I, we're doing a follow-up on, on some of these projects and when we store all the junk about our model results for a stability run, I can easily have a file that is over a gigabyte of stuff because I'll store results, I'll store modal analysis. Okay. You have to work with what you had. And when they started out, it was very model limited. Uh, we still see some of these limitations. Like if you model a generator right now, there's two character generator IDs, which drives me nuts, but um, we haven't changed it. If you look at the power flow when it was originally introduced and what we have now, um, the grid interconnection sizes are bigger, or maybe they're 25 times bigger than the size of models we used and when I started doing power flows in the 1980s. But computer memory has increased by 100,000, so we have a lot of memory. You know, if your computer doesn't have gigabytes of memory, you're going to be like getting a computer. Uh, we've changed the model some, but not not to a large extent. I mean, we've got switch shunts, uh, individual objects for generators and loads, fax, HVDC, and PIMS correction tables, uh, but they're pretty much the same. We have started adding latitude and longitude, so we can kind of assume that now. Powerful on weather, human activity depends on weather. Some of the traditional parameters depend on weather, like line ratings. But now with all of this renewable generation, weather is playing a major role, as, as I mentioned. So we're putting it in. So if you say you want to put weather in, what do you need to do that? Um, well, you would need you need weather information. I mean, you can't model weather if you don't know the weather. You need to be able to map the weather information of pertinent grid components, and then you have to have adequate models of how the weather impacts the grid components. The remainder of the presentation is going to show you that this is pretty straightforward to do. So this is this is actually all the visualizations I show are coming out of Power World. Um, Current and historical weather information is ubiquitously available for the most part. When we started getting into this, I was talking to my students about getting weather data, and they said they found a source where we got all the world's weather data going back to the 1930s on an hourly basis, and we got it for $300. Okay. Well, in, in subsequent analysis, I mean, students tell you as a faculty member lots of things. Uh, subsequent analysis, we really didn't have much from the 1930s. We had like maybe two or three stations. But as we got further along, we got we got more stations. Uh, we had enough stations that when when a winter storm Uri hit Texas in uh, February of 2000, I guess it was 22, I think. Um, maybe it was 21. Was it 21? Yeah. Uh, it got cold in College Station, and, and we had a lot of problems, but it was not record cold in College Station. I looked at the record in College Station. The record cold in College Station was January 30th, 1949, and it got down to minus three degrees. And I was like, whoa, that would be cold. What would happen if that 
weather occurred now. So I used our weather set and I visualized the weather from January 31, 1949, and College Station is right there. And we were actually the coldest place in the country, but the rest of the country wasn't really that cold that day. So it, it North Texas was not cold. Uh, we were colder than you guys. We were back colder than Wisconsin. So it probably wouldn't have had the impact. Now, when I talked to one of my friends who's the state climatologist in Texas, he said, yeah, but 1899 was cold in a lot of places and it was colder, but it wasn't record cold in, in College Station, but we don't have 1899 data. So I haven't really looked at that yet. Um, this is some of the data we have. We have weather stations from 1949 going up to the present 2023 or 2022. Uh, we had about 1,600 in the late 40s, and now we got about 23,000 a day. Uh, some have missing data, but that decreases as you go forward. So the assumption is we've got a lot of weather data. Um, and then, then you say, well, how, how should we identify this weather data? And we've been working actually with the utility on the Pacific Northwest on this too. And <clears throat> we've been going through how stuff is identified Turns out there's no common standard for identify, identifying weather stations, but there are some pretty widely used one. One is the four character identifiers that you commonly see when you fly, like uh, CLL is College Station Airport. Uh, I assume Spokane is KGEG, something like that. Is that what it is? GEG, yeah. Yeah, it's GEG, but then they put the K in front of it. Um, you can actually download weather data there worldwide from about 4,900 stations using the, this is called the ICAO convention. The World Meteorological Association uses a five digit identifier and, and sometimes you see data in that format. So while I was sitting around IAH, which is the airport in Houston, I late yesterday morning, I downloaded the data for that moment in time, and this this is it, you just download as a spreadsheet, you just go to that point and get it. it, comes out as a spreadsheet. We've set up Power World, so this can directly load into Power World. So I loaded this into Power World, and then I visualized the temperature that we saw yesterday morning, and that's what it looked like. And all the dots are, are the places where I was getting valid weather data from, okay. And you may look at that and you might say, well, who cares? I mean, this is like, you can see this from the weather channel, but we're bringing this into a power flow. So this, this is not, this is, this is power world. So that means that every one of those locations, I know the temperature, but I also know the wind speed and I know the cloud cover percentage, which I can then use to do stuff like saying, what would be the output of all the renewable generators across the country? And this is the wind speed from, it was uh, 6.07 standard time, so it was 7.07 Eastern or uh, daylight savings time. But that's a visualization of the wind and the solar across the country. And I immediately know at that time, this is probably what the renewable generation across the country was doing. And, you know, there was, in Texas, there was very little solar solar because it was, you know, seven in the morning. Um, there's a little bit of solar here. There wasn't much solar in the West Coast. So suddenly I've got a consistent model for the current weather and I could use that in a power flow to do analysis with. So we've been working on this. And when I, when I do this, people will say, well, we don't care about the past. We care about the future. Give us the future. And I'm like, well, first of all, I don't prove I don't develop future weather. Well, nobody develops future weather, but uh, but there are lots of people out there that will give you forecasts. If you're an electric utility, you already have a lot of forecasts. So you can get this. Uh, one time I went, to, um, I think it was, it was some meteorological organization in Colorado and they showed me the weather for the next year because they had run a model. I mean, people run, long-term models. So uh, if the utilities want future weather estimates, they can get it. Uh, you know, we're probably, when, when we do analysis with this, we'll look at a lot of historical data to see what are the outlier conditions. And you could get, lots of people will provide you with forecasted weather. 
so let's assume the weather is available, then you have to map it to the electrical grid components. Um, in, in, in a large case right now, for the most part, we have pretty good geographic information. We've got pretty good geographic information for the North American electric grids. Not perfect, but it, it's pretty good. Um, when we talk about synthetic grids, which are the fictional grids that we create, we by design always put in geographic information. And then once you have that and you need to know the weather at a particular location where you don't have a weather station, you have a, a 2D scattered data interpolation problem, but there's pretty good ways to do that. Um, we've used Delaney, we use Shepard's method, we use closest neighbor. So usually we can get pretty good estimates of the weather. This is the Delaney triangulation of the weather stations we had from 1949. In Delaney triangulation, to figure out the points inside each of the triangles, you just use the three vertices. That works good as long as you're not at a at a like more of a boundary point. Uh, we were looking at some of the results for California, and we we're looking at some of the coastal regions here. And the triangles along some coastal regions, one of the points is Honolulu or some it's, it's some place in the Hawaiian Islands, just because that's the, the next weather station they have available in 1949. So that works most of the time. Uh, when you get to 2022, there's a lot more data. So our triangles are much smaller. Um, now, because we've got weather stations in the Gulf of Mexico, we pick up stuff coming off of the Gulf as well. So we're pretty good on, on a lot of coastal regions now, but still not perfect along the, the Pacific coast. And you also get into, well, there's there's uh, winter storm Uri, kind of during the worst of it when Texas was coming close to a collapse. Um, I think this is the zero. So you can see there is a lot of cold weather across the mid part of the country. Yeah. Uh, there are exceptions to this. One exception is the Columbia River Gorge. Uh, you know, in the Columbia River Gorge, probably a lot of you have been in the Columbia River Gorge. You know that the wind conditions in the gorge are very different from the wind conditions outside of the gorge. So if you want to estimate the output of the wind turbines in the gorge area, you might not be using the closest weather station. So in that case, you, you figure out a weather station and, and we've been working with utilities to find out what are, the, what are the weather stations to use to do this. If a location is that important to utility, chances are they already have weather there. I mean, it's pretty easy to put in a, a weather station a location. Um, coastal regions are another one. Mountain passes are another region. The last one is what about the models for grid weather impacts? Uh, there's a lot of models that exist and undoubtedly more will be created. This is saying how, how would the models used in a power flow vary with weather? And one that is widely known is, you know, a wind turbine, what its maximum megawatt will be as a function of the wind speed. That's, that's well known. There's different classes of wind models. Others aren't as well known. So our, our approach on this is to say, let's just do what we did with stability. And in stability, we started out with just a handful of models. Uh, this is a result from a 1960 stability code from GE. And then we just added more and more and more models. And at Power World, we support many hundreds of different models now. And, you know, like Jamie Weber was just telling me about Power World just added a grid, grid forming inverter model, and they're just constantly being developed. So you can just develop models. So the way we coded this up is essentially the same as what we do for stability models. It's very easy to add new models. Um, Initially, I coded this up with six different models. We just increased it to seven. Uh, some were the wind turbines. These are the wind turbine models. Wind turbine models, the bottom axis is wind speed. The top or the x axis is wind speed. The y axis is normalized output. Wind turbines come in different classes class one, class two, class three, class four, depending on the expected wind that they get. So, by default, we've got these generic models set up, which we just got from a, a paper from our friends at NREL that they had all the data in. So I just coded it up, it's very simple. Um, 
so this is then saying, okay, if I wanted to know what the renewable generation portfolio of today would do, if it saw the weather that we saw in Texas, I mean, across the country in January 31st, 1949, we've got it, okay. That's the wind velocity. It's a contour of wind speed from eight miles an hour up to 16 miles per hour. Of what we had in 1949, I can play that into the current conditions. So I've, I've got that. I can say what would happen. Uh, we've been doing all sorts of different uh, contours of this. This is one that I made up when I was doing a presentation in September of last year. Uh, now I'm using a green contour. <laughs> Uh, we're just playing around with different color combinations. There's still wind speed. As looking at this, I thought, why is it like so windy in Florida? Because Florida usually isn't windy. I was like, oh, that was during Hurricane Ian. So it's like we have the hurricane data coming up there. Uh, we have uh, then gone through the EIA 860 data. If you're familiar with the EIA 860 data, which is publicly available, uh, it has, for each wind generating place, it tells you the wind quality class, its design speed, the turbine height, uh, or the hub height, the turbine model, the turbine manufacturer. So we've got a lot of data about every location in the U.S. If it's solar, it'll tell you the tracking type, the tilt angle, and the azimuth angle. So we've got all that, and we've loaded it up for the, for the U.S. generators. Uh, then we can play different different weather conditions, and we play typically hourly conditions. We might go through a whole year. Uh, for example, this this was the maximum that we think we would have saw for wind and solar output across the country in 2021, and that was saying we would have had uh, about 109, 110 gigawatts of wind, and about 45 uh, gigawatts of solar. Okay, and that, that would be the maximum, and that's where it is. And it would have occurred at 1 p.m. Central Time in March. Um, we're playing around with some models for generators and temperatures. Generators and temper temperatures, except if it's a thermal unit, it's not a, a direct correlation. It's more of a probabilistic correlation. Generators are more likely to fail. This is This is temperature. And this is the probability of a failure. Um, they are more likely to fail at high temperatures and low fail at, at low temperatures, but it's not set in stone like with wind. So it becomes a probabilistic. So we're setting some of these up so that we can play different conditions to say, well, what would happen if the 1949 weather occurred or this weather or that weather? Uh, that's one of our temperature models. It's very simple. Uh, more models, uh, a current one that we're working a lot on, and we've got utilities working on this with us, is transmission line limits. They depend on temperature, wind, insulation along the right of way. Uh, the simplest ones are just saying you have to make it a, a temperature dependent. So we're putting all that in. Uh, we can then play different conditions. Of course, we make up our synthetic grids. Synthetic grids might have current anticipated generation. Uh, this is 2019. Uh, green is wind and yellow solar, black is coal, brown natural gas, red nuclear. And then what if we had some from 1930? So we can play, or 2030, we can play the 2030 conditions, uh, which has a lot more wind and solar, most of which won't get built. But, you know, we can play all these scenarios and we, we can tell people, uh, what's the likelihood of a, of a, a weather situation occurring? Uh, this became an issue in Texas in July, July of last year because ERCOT set a, a then all-time peak of 78 gigawatts, and they went out with a conservation appeal, which did not play well publicly because ERCOT had been saying, we fixed all the temperature-related issues that we saw with Yuri, but they had to do this appeal and the reason why they did the appeal was because they have, in Texas, we have the most wind of any state, and we've got a lot of solar, but we did not have much wind or solar. Well, we, we had some solar, but we didn't have much wind that day because it wasn't windy, okay? Uh, so that caused some problems. Well, we loaded this up, and we used this as a, this condition as a verification 
So we took our 6,700 bus model. I mean, we've, we've got actual workout models, but I, I showed the synthetic models. And we said, what's in the model for wind and solar? And it, it was like this. And it was saying, the model was saying, we've got lots of wind and lots of solar. But then straightforwardly, very easily, because we had the weather condition, because I, I, we have the weather for that day, uh, we just loaded that up. And then we applied it, and suddenly we had uh, wind and solar that was pretty close to what we were actually seeing in ERCOT. I, I did highlight on this slide because it was pretty hot in Texas that day, that we were the 76th hottest place in the world that day, not, not the hottest. Um, we got, that's cloud cover percent. Uh, this is wind speed that we have. You can see the wind speed it's not, the wind isn't blowing over Texas. And we knew that, but now the power flow knows that. Okay, and that we allowed us to get solar. So then we resolved, this was before, and this was going through the analysis that was with what we had. And we looked at what ERCOT actually was showing and we got a very close correlation with what ERCOT was showing uh, recognizing that one of the challenges with doing this validation is that the wind speed across the state was changing. So if you look at what ERCOT actually got, it did gradually raise between 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. from 2200 to 3600 megawatts. Um, ours, in our model, we were getting 3.3 gigawatts. Okay, but that if I if I change some scaling values and one of the scaling values we have is scaling the wind speed we're observing at the surface to what we would see at the hub height. And that's an input parameter that you could set on a on a generator by generator basis, but we've just defaulted it to 1.4. Um, one of the there, there's the model of what with the wind in there, what we were seeing in the power flow, and you can note that there's very little wind in that now. And this this is directly loaded up. It was it, quicker to do than it is to go through the slides. Um, yeah, and then, then there was another one. Uh, the next day we had, a, or I guess it was two days later, we had an issue, but we did that one too. Um, I will point out one of the challenges with doing this is Texas has a lot of wind in the mid part, kind of in in this part of the state, and that's okay because the wind is pretty consistent there. But we also have a lot of wind down in what we call the lower Rio Grande Valley along the Gulf Coast. And if you're familiar with coastal regions, wind can be very uh different between whether you're right by the coast or whether you're a little bit inland. So these are showing some of the values that we were picking up uh, on different wind speeds. Like this one here, it's saying it's six miles per hour there, whereas that one's saying it's 22 miles per hour there. And that's not that big of a, a part of the state. So there's a lot of variation into which weather station we were actually using to get this. Um, yeah, so that just kind of repeats that. Uh, we also have a large amount of historical data. As I said, we've essentially got all the data going back to the 1940s. What my students tell me is that this is all public. Because <laughs> the guy that sold us the data, we didn't sign any license agreement or anything. And we're like, <laughs> who owns this data? And I talked to the state climatologist, and he's like, there's a website I can show you. So they said it's all freely shareable. So we're probably, Power World supports this. It has a time series binary, binary format. And we're probably just gonna put all this out on the web so that anybody can download it. Um, so this is, this is examples where we will go through and take like our 82,000 bus synthetic grid and play the weather for a year across it. Um, and it goes pretty fast if you're, you can do, you can either just look at the generation impact without solving the power flow, you can solve a DC power flow or AC power flow. Obviously solving an AC power flow is going to take longer than a DC power flow. And if I just solve the generation, I can do it very quickly. Uh, this would be wind output, green and, and yellow solar output for whatever year I ran. I 
don't know, that might have been 1949. But then we could say, well, what was what was the highest in 1949? What was the lowest? And we're going through right now looking for wind and solar, uh, what we call wind, <coughs> wind resource droughts and solar resource droughts, where you have a situation where the wind just doesn't blow for a while. Uh, the Midwest had one in, in this region in January 2020 that was very impactful on them because they, they didn't have any nearly practically no wind during that time period. Uh, this is another example. Uh, that's URI. I think I've got more temperatures. Uh, again, looking at grid impacts, and I can show the movies if I can. I want to go. They're not. They're not in the slides. I have to get out of the slides. Yeah, it is. Yeah, this is. These movies are very simple to make. So are you sharing the screen or? Yeah, you oh. sharing the screen. This is I I. This is just a temperature contour movie. I've got the wind and solar on there, but they're not the focus because they're they're in the wrong colors. But this is during winter storm Uri. Uh, as this is the time, it's just going by uh, at you know one hour. Blah 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 blah. And you can just see how it's varying. Okay, so that, that's the temperature, and you might say, well, power engineers shouldn't care too much about that. But what we care about, let me speed this up. It's like we, we can run wind movies as well, and here we can look at the renewable generation that's going on on the grid. And this is the variation in the wind, the orange is showing a, a contour of the wind speed. And we're gonna start using this on our SPP project because now we've got all the generation in the west and all the generation in the east, all being greater than 99% by megawatt of the generation mapped to a, a, a geographic location and a wind class model. And then we can take wind for any year and play it into that model. And on the SPP project, we're looking at an economic analysis if we join the East and the West grid. And a lot of the driver for that economic analysis is the fact that you might have different wind conditions in the West and in the East. So now we can do all this analysis and run through solving power flows, or optimal power flows, hopefully of the DC sort, and, and get some results for them. Okay. So, uh, I just have to show my last picture. I should use this. That, that is our control room that we have at Texas A&M. Uh, this was actually during the PSERC meeting from last December. We're doing this interconnect study between the Eastern and Western grids. And one of the places where the grids come together is Sydney, Nebraska. So this is Jordan Cook. She's a new graduate student. She got her degree from Baylor. And I said, Jordan, where are you from? And she said, oh, this little town in Nebraska that nobody's heard of. I said, well, where? And she said, Sydney. I'm like, Sydney, that's like famous because there, there's a substation there where the Eastern and Western grids come together. So that's Jordan showing, showing off our, uh, some of our visualizations. Uh, if you want to see any of the papers on this, they're all available there, or you can email me, and I think we've got some time for questions. So we are open for questions. Uh, we can start from audience here and online participants. Please raise your hand or post your questions online. Right. So, yeah, so you are using the weather data in call. Weather data has its own uncertainty. So how to quantify that effect on the power flow levels? 
Right. So anytime we use anything, there's uncertainty associated with it. Okay. I I would say in in the hourly forecast or the hourly measurements, I would say they're probably pretty good. Okay. I I will tell you one of one of the changes I made in Power World from when this was first released is when it was first released, we stored weather data as singles, you know, four bytes. And then we were thinking about it and we thought, you know, none of this weather stuff is known to more than a byte resolution. When you, when you measure temperature, you measure the temperature in either Fahrenheit or, or, or Celsius, but unless you're doing a, you know, a thermometer in the mouth, you're just going to say yeah, it's like 52 degrees outside or 52 degrees outside. You're not going to be more specific than that. So you just store it as a byte. Or when you measure the wind speed, it's like it's they typically measure it in knots or, or meters per second. But if you say it's like 12 knots or 13 knots, nobody cares whether it's between that because the wind is varying. So there's there's certainly uncertainty in this, and there you know we have techniques for doing. I we haven't coded them in here, but there's techniques for doing uncertainty analysis. But I I would say of of all the things, probably what's coming off of the measurements is probably less uncertain. Although we do have missing measurements, that's certainly true. And you know like on on the coastal example I showed you in South Texas. If the utility that was down there really wanted to use that in the power flow, they probably have weather stations at those wind farm locations already. Okay, but even across a wind farm, I mean, wind farm is a big location. The wind speed is going to be variable across there as well. So we're our purpose here is to give you a pretty good estimate of what's going on. But at, at a particular wind farm, what one turbine is seeing and what the other turbine is seeing is going to be variable as well. Uh -huh. um, um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, the, uh, the weather map is very good. And I see there's uh, um, forecasting for the whole American area. And uh, when some uh, wind power decrease, some area increase. So is this considered in the power flow uh, coordination for the whole America or um, just a small area. Well, people are just starting to use this in power flows now. I, and, and I don't want to imply that utilities don't have good wind forecasting software. They have excellent wind forecasting software. Okay, and wind forecasts are used all the time in figuring out how much wind generation you're going to have for the next day or two days or things like that. This is just saying, let's take that same information and bring it into a power flow. So they already have the forecast. And you know, forecasts have their own uncertainty associated with them. And, you know, we all see that when they say it's going to be, you know, 50 degrees and it's 40 and it snows or something like that. But it, it, that it, we're, we're using the best that's available. And, you know, one, one of the places we're going with this is looking at the impact of ice storms on the electric grid. And the forecast we're getting that can be gotten in terms of the, the spatial differentiation between quantities is getting quite low. It's down in like two kilometers or something like that. And we had a bunch of tornadoes in, in Texas, a little ways away from College Station. They kept interrupting my show with their tornado things. And they were showing the tornado going through this town like block by block. It's like, yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, there's a lot of weather data available. So I'll take an online question. Um, Jeff, go ahead. Hey, Tom, Jeff Dago. Nice talk. Nice talk. Um, <laughs> good, to, good to see you in action again. Um, I just picture of you on the wall here, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I can turn on my camera here. So, uh, um, <laughs> so uh, you mentioned icing just now, but um, I was thinking about icing when you showed the uh, winter storm Uri and the wind output and things. And it seems like you'd have all the data if you gather temperature and, and dew point and wind speed and stuff to be able to come up with a little bit more sophisticated estimate of, of wind turbine output, considering if there's icing on the blades. Um, and because I, I think that was one of the effects that, that they saw in, in 2021. Um, so have you guys looked into that uh, yet in terms of, uh, you know, maybe 
doing a little bit more analytics to estimate wind output rather than just wind speed? Well, right. We we haven't, and that is certainly an area of concern because, as you know, icing on the blades was a big issue. I did talk to we have we have a state climatologist who's a faculty member at Texas A&M. So I was talking to him about doing this with icing, and he's he's pretty interested in this. So we'll probably work with him on it. He said with ice storms, there's not a lot of data available because there's not a lot of ice storms, but. The idea, and when I when I talked about stability models and the analogy, is we we want to get people to develop better models. It isn't necessarily us developing the better models. It's somebody developing the better models that, as an industry, we might standardize and say, you know, this is a pretty good model for a wind turbine with respect to icing. And maybe it comes out of NREL, maybe it comes out of PNNL, maybe it comes out of WSU. I mean, it, it can come out of anywhere, and it's just a model that we use, you know, and that that's what I want. I mean, we're doing some of this work, but I think it's, you know, we just need more models. And there are some models out there, but I just want to code up the models so I can make them available to people, not necessarily develop them myself. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, no, it sounds sounds interesting, and and I do think the icing, uh, you know, is something that's probably fairly, you know, with with some level of of precision. Going back to your earlier point about, you know, uh, maybe not super accurate, but some level of accuracy you can do with just temperature and dew point, um, you could probably do a pretty good guess. Right, because you know we we had a drought in Texas last summer, so we were all watching the rain, and the. What they seem to show in the weather applications in terms of how much precipitation a location is getting seems to be very specific. I mean, they seem to have very high accuracy on that. I'm like, well, we should use this in the electric industry if we're saying, okay, here's a transmission line and we know how much precipitation is falling over that line. And we know the loading on that line and we know all the weather conditions so maybe we can estimate what the icing on that line is in pretty good real time. I mean, that would be a pretty nice smart grid thing. Yeah, I, I want to piggyback on that. Something Jeff and I have talked about related to Advanced Grid Institute is what about hydro? As, as you talk about, right. um, one of the challenges we've talked about with the Pacific Northwest is um, if we have a low rain, a low water year, and then... Mm. And then we have uh, highs, highs, or low lows is when the wind stops. What are some of the impacts on that? So um, are you looking, I mean, are you looking at, at using that weather any in some of your hydro? I haven't added hydro in here. I know Power World was working with the utilities in the Pacific Northwest, and we had to adjust some of the hydro models because the water levels were so low. I think that has fixed to some extent because of all the snow. But yeah, that that would be another thing that could come into this is hydro. I haven't done that. And maybe again it's PNNL or WSU or or whoever come up and saying, yeah, this this is you know, you need a data source. I mean the the reservoir levels is going to change slower, I would assume, you know, because they're big places. But I mean, it could be that that becomes another input parameter and then we make use of it. The the weather data, to bring the weather data into power flow from a memory perspective, it's not, it's not that hard. And it could be that there's hydro, I'm, I'm sure there's hydro station data that we can get and just load it up. And then it's just saying, okay, if I know the hydro at this location, can I make use of it? Maybe you can. I mean, and maybe, you know, like we, we run stability and in stability, you have assumptions on what the what the head is on the hydro plant, stuff like that. Maybe we modify those models to say, you know, let's use the real time data or, you know, so, yeah, that would be another another thing to do. So, so maybe one, sorry, <laughs> just a quick comment on, on the same uh, question that we're discussing. So uh, I guess. Um, one question is also about how, what about the disaster model? So for example, how does the weather or extreme weather event impacts the components, right? So we're talking about this weather component interaction models. Have you looked into how, um, how and what are main parameters that we should actually be using from the weather model 
to do, to really figure out what the impacts at the component level is going to be or are you familiar with some work that we can uh yes, look we into? were talking about it at breakfast <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes i want to work with you on that <laughs> no i haven't i haven't done that but i, I know somebody who is interested i have in seen that. a lot of work in the civil engineering department they actually look into those kind of uh, extreme uh, like weather parameterization and how it affects the lines for example you're talking about the loading the ice loading or the um, wind loading for the towers that is pretty unique if, if that can be also integrated to visualize what an extreme event can do. The other, the other uh, area that does a lot is that ag. So we actually have an ag network that looks at to try to predict if it's going to freeze and and other conditions for ag communities. And they have a they have a app and a website where you can actually decide on some things related to equipment. Or into your your crops based on what they're showing, and integrating some of that data. So it'll be interesting to know if some of the ag applications we may be able to tap into related to the icing, particularly because they've done some work in that area to on icing of plants, and there could be some similarities. Yeah, the the bigger thought here is to say. In the power flow, our bread and butter application, let's bring in additional data sources and utilize them. Yeah. And to do that, we have to say, is, is the data available somewhere? Can we map it to our components of interest? And then do we have the models? And that's a community thing. And I'm just saying, we started out with temperatures and wind speed and, and cloud cover percentage. Uh, kind of a funny aside on cloud cover percentage. When the initial student, maybe I shouldn't say this, but when the initial student coded this up, he the the data is reported as as a, a zero digit number from zero, uh, he thought up to that was the percentage of cloud cover. So he thought zero was zero percent cloud cover, and he thought eighty eight was eighty percent cloud cover. But it's eighths. Jeff probably knows this because he's a pilot. And it, it, it's eighths of a sky cover. So eight is, is is total coverage. It's cloudy. And I looked at the data and it's like, it's never getting more than 80% cloudy. And one of my students said, well, yeah, that's like, we were looking at Texas. He's like, well, that's Texas. You know, the, the skies are not cloudy all day. <laughs> like, the, the skies are cloudy all day in some places. <laughs> so we fix that. I mean, there's just like startup transients. But I mean, yeah, it's looking and saying, okay, what data sources can we use, historical, forecasted? And of course, once we say we can use it, then we talk to the hydro people or we talk to the freezing people, you know, and we get their data, you know, and then, then we can use it in, in power flows and uh, planning studies, you know, wildfire risks, things like that. I mean, all this can factor in. Uh -huh. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, uh, in that impact analysis that you uh, represented, did you also include the uh, control room operators' actions as well? And if yes, I assume in that what, it, in what? impact analysis for example when you show the when the wind is changing and how the power oh. flow is changing and so no, no no i i didn't i didn't show the control room the the operator that and i i am very interested in that, yeah. that question because in in this i was just saying for an optimal power flow study i need to know the maximum output of my wind turbine and if it's you know, if it's rated, then I just use rated. But if the wind isn't blowing, I can't use rated. And we were doing, we're doing a project for ARPA E where we're providing uh, models for the for their go competition, their grid optimization competition. And we have to make up scenarios. And Dick O'Neill always tells us you can't have your solar running at night. If it's a night scenario, you got to make sure your solar's off. And now we can make sure our solar's off because because we have this on on modeling operator actions. We'll do simulations, and that's what these kids and they're not kids; these are adults. I'm not kidding. These adults are doing the simulation. Um, some of them are very adult. Um, what the, these people are doing this simulation, and they're they're playing. This is a just a 42 bus model. They're playing at the at the particular moment. 
but they're pretending to be like a grid operator. But as you simulate larger grids, you might have to simulate the behavior of multiple grid operators. And whenever we do you know, stability or, or longer term dynamics, which is what this was, you, you have to realize that there's gonna be a human in the loop and the human's gonna respond within not seconds, but certainly within minutes. And how do we how do we model that is like an open question. You know, it gets into the dispatcher training simulators. If you just have one dispatcher that you're training and it's a small system, then you just have one person, but we might have to have, you know, automated ones. And then you say, well what's what's this chat GBT you know, <laughs> <laughs> dispatcher training simulator doing? I have a couple of comments online, so I'll quickly read it. So it's from Andy Eden. Greetings from Portland. Nice talk today. Thanks. Question about hydro. Uh, would add that I would like to add that the DOE has a new hydrogen hydropower collegiate competition that may be of interest. It is run by NREL, and I'm on the steering committee, expanding the competitions to cross specializations. For example, hydro modeling, power flow, data science, etc. is something I have been thinking of introducing as a way to broaden student participation. Um, there is one more. I'm at Portland General Electric and also teaching a smart grid course at Oregon State University. This term, it might be nice to convince or cajole the US DOE to stand up a power systems modeling student challenge. Let me know. I hereby informally challenge both Texas A&M and WSU. <laughs> <laughs> what I, I maybe I shouldn't say this, but I, I'll I'll just say what I, is general. DOE runs these prize competitions, right. you know, and I did not know about that, but you don't have to put in a lot to win a bunch of money. <laughs> 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 and this is great optimization. Great optimization, which I'm working on is ARPA, and that's a totally different critter. But the ones that I saw, um, it, I, I, I like, it, it doesn't seem to be widely known that you can put stuff in there that, for me, it looks like a PSERC proposal and it looks pretty good. And they just pay, the reason why they do it is because it avoids them having to write a contract. Because you, when you write a contract as, as DOE, that's a, a massive undertaking. Whereas if you just have a competition and you say, you know, there's 10 people in and or 10 teams and two of them win, here, here's $50,000, it's like, it's okay. You know, and you go into the next round and, you know, you get $200,000. It's for them, it's the same as doing like a grant, except they don't have to do the grant. It's just a prize, and I didn't, I didn't realize this. So, but the, the the control room question brings up the issue of where this will be useful, and you can see very large numbers of actual where you will use this once you've got it all uh, put it out into the power flow. Uh, because right now, in the control room, for example, like you said, they're getting the uh, forecast data just all the time. And of course, the forecast is, is is a lot better the closer you are to the time, right? So next hour, we have perfect forecast almost, and next day, it's a little less. And But the way it works now in the control room is that the weather data is figured out into the load and generation forecasting and not directly into the power flow. And this, Probably right. gives you gives you that opportunity to just feed it feed it right in. The other thing, that yeah, that, that's not saying you don't send it elsewhere. Of course, you send it elsewhere, but it's saying why don't you give the power flow this data? Same thing. Yeah. And it's it's like it's coming in <laughs> it's, it's already. Just Once give it to the power that. flow yeah. and use it. And that's the whole idea is to say let's use it. But more than the control room, which is kind of a limited time scale, you once you go into operations planning. See, now you're looking at day ahead for sure. Right. Uh, often for uh, in the in the Northwest, you're also looking at the water data, the hydro data. Right. Okay. And and that's uh, that's a different number. You don't have that at the moment, but you can you can also forecast that as to what the flows are going to be through or, or, or the storage levels are going to be at the hydro stations. And then finally, I think of longer term. You know, the, the way planning is done today is all production costing models, which is hourly data for the next several years. Yeah. All right. And that is where you need these long term forecasts, like you said, a year's forecast worth of, worth of data that you can feed in, because right now they're just kludging the data completely. 
terms of the right and it's like i don't know 2024's weather but what if i said let's assume it was 2020's weather and 2019's weather and 2018's weather and 2017's weather and if you want to run 1949 weather it doesn't matter or if you say no 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 we want to forecast it's like wait there's lots of people that'll forecast for but, but it's for contingency you. analysis instead of doing the highest and the lowest right low you know, loads you're doing it for other conditions right and we might say as an industry NERC or or WEC or somebody says these are the days hours conditions we want you to run and one of the nice things about using real data is I don't have to know anything about meteorology to download data. I, I don't have to make sure that my wind speeds are matching the physics of the world. I know when I got that data yesterday, it's matching the world physics because it's what occurred. You know, and if somebody who does forecasting wants to provide me the data or the utilities, the data, great. Uh-huh. Right, last question. So yeah, I just have a clarification question on your database. Uh, so the wind speed that you're using, is it just a scalar value or also a direction? No, we, we have direction. We haven't used direction, but we have direction. So it's on your database? What? The database that you have or the data that you collected. So direction is also mentioned? Yeah, it's wind direction is also included there. So we have wind. We, the ones that we have right now are temperature dew point wind speed, wind direction, and sky cover percentage now correct. Yeah, and that, that's hourly. But you know, a lot of stations, even O'Hare would not report for some hours. So then you just kind of have to, either you use a close by station or you estimate it from like interpolate. Just to add, like you said, you're gonna make it available. Uh, do you know when? <laughs> Ah, uh, that's a good question. I keep asking my grad students to say, when, let's just get this out there. They, they've told me, I mean, I, you know, I might be a grad student, but when you, you know, grad students have issues with faculty and faculty have. Uh, <laughs> but they, they, they have got, they have gotten a lot of data that is in pretty good shape and we're we're gonna make it available. And they tell me, cause I say, well, what are the, what are, are there any intellectual property issues here? And they said, no, 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 nothing to worry about. <laughs> nothing to worry about. All right, let's, oh, you have a question? Okay, this is the last question. <laughs> okay. One more. Is that if I use the model, like you're applying to the model, is that if I compressible or is that- Is it compressible? Yes. Uh, any data is compressible. Yeah, but uh, how about if you compressible that data and then apply to the system or the processor? Does that also have the good performance in the... The good way? Yeah. I think good performance, she's asking in terms yeah. of... Oh, benefits we, of compressing. We, we compressed our... Compressed is probably the wrong word. Um, we, we store our weather data now in bytes. By, so there's five bytes, you know, um, so that that compressed it. Now for the weather sets that we use, it's for a year is about now a hundred bag of data. Whether you could compress that further or not, I, I don't know, but it used to be a gig. So we're like, eh, this is like, I mean, if I can give you a hundred meg file for the weather for, I don't know if that's, I, I can't remember if that's just North America or the world, but that's pretty good. You know, and of course, there's lots of things you can expand on this. I'm, I'm not, you know, the meteorologist, and it might be that people decide, oh, I want, you know, one kilometer resolution on stuff, and I get it from the Weather Channel or whoever. Great, use that. You know. But, you know, when you said uh, <laughs> that, uh, look, you, you had, in the old days, you had to worry about data because uh, you, you're, you only had 64 kilobytes or 56 kilobytes or something. But remember that's the first state estimators and the contingency analysis, we were using 64 kilobytes code. So it not only didn't, you couldn't get the whole data, it couldn't even get the program in there. So you have to actually swap in the different subroutines of the power flow <laughs> to 
be able to run the marathon. <laughs> it was a fun time. You know it better than me, but I was there for some of it. I, I remember when I was working in the 80s and we had a prime computer and our, our software guy said he had upgraded the memory to t for 256 more kilobytes. <laughs> it's like, what are we going to do with all that? <laughs> and then he said, you have virtual space of four gigabytes. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to use that. And I quickly realized that four gigabytes of virtual memory is not four gigabytes of memory. It like, took forever. I mean, everything's swapping out the hard drive. And we didn't even have hard drives that were four gigabytes now. So. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, Tom, what I see, the incorporation of uh, weather data into the power flow, what you have uh, started on, this is the path towards the resilience models that we are seeking for the future, where you have uh, extreme events that you can model and you can do what if analysis of uh, sequence of uh, contingencies that you can put on it. And it's a very nice uh, platform for. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of this is driven by having geographic coordinates. Mm -hmm. And the, I mean, you need geographic coordinates for this. And the PowerFlow models, this like a raw file does not have geographic coordinates, but a, their GIC file does have geographic coordinates. So as, as we get this, which I know we're going to get this. I mean, you can look on Google Maps and find every lemonade <laughs> stand. How come I can't find a big substation? <laughs> I mean, it's like, seriously. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I get that there, I mean, I should say, I'm very familiar with the CEII where, you know, there's data that can't be disclosed, but facility locations is not CEII, CEII, the, the critical energy infrastructure, energy electricity infrastructure information. It is available and the location of every generator is available in the US in the EI860 data set. So if you want to know where all the nuclear reactors are, they're not hidden. <laughs> you can find them. All right, with that note, let's stand from the over. And you can sign for the conversation. Yeah, because we have to get ready for a defense. Yeah. So, um, so there's pizza in.